um, from now on the sessions on recording um, with a potential option to publish. That doesn't mean that it will be published, um, but we'll be reviewing uh, the option of that. Because I think that, you know, the topic that we're going to be tackling uh, today is definitely, I think, of interest and the mm -hmm. message that, uh, that we're going to be uh, hoping to get to should be spread much further um, to a lot of investment uh, types, folks who aren't in uh, those safety yeah. things, um, generally. So I'm, I'm thinking that it could be useful to record it. All right, great. So, uh, Luke, uh, a few uh, words about you. Um, I, I mean, there, there's really quite a lot to say, I think. Um, but, uh, you know, a, as a very quick summary, uh, you founded uh, Giga Fund, uh, which is where you currently, um, uh, where you're currently doing investments through uh, after having previously co-founded um, Founders Fund with Peter Thiel and Ken Howie, who you originally um, co-founded PayPal with. So um, you have quite an uh, interesting history already. Your main interest throughout uh, this time really has always been uh, in companies that you really believe in will have the most significant impact on the world. Um, and you serve on the space export of uh, directors uh, research gate, and you also were a director, which I didn't know before actually. Uh, at DeepMind, I was the first seed investor uh, in, in DeepMind. That's crazy. Okay, I had no idea. I also, for example, didn't know that uh, Jan is still uh, invested in it um, as well. So that I, brought, I, brought, I brought Jan on the board of DeepMind to focus on the safety aspect, but then shortly afterwards, Google took over. Okay, well, um, um, I think that's that's uh, quite a quite a strong uh, quite a strong. I segue into the discussion, but I think, you know, just to um, kind of round it up, I think you really, um, really care quite deeply, right, about uh, the long-term future for life. And I think if anyone really has a, has a good perspective on how we can leverage the private sector to do that, then, uh, then it's really you. So thank you so much for, uh, for joining here. Um, and um, I think, you know, maybe actually we could start on that, uh, that note on, on DeepMain, what, what, what got you interested in, uh, in um, and kind of and, and engaged in DeepMind in the first place, and, and how was it uh, um, to get to get Jan involved? Um, well, uh, I'd been looking at different uh, AI companies every once in a while. It was a, an interest area of mine from from childhood, uh, but none of them were run by people that were any good as CEOs, and. Uh, Demis was the first one that I met where there was, there was technological promise. And I had heard about the, the deep learning technology maybe a, like a year before a, a deep mind. Um, but there was also uh, an incredible CEO. Like we, you know, yeah, we, uh, it was, I thought Demis could, could, could actually pull it off. And if it, actually, I thought it was, such a strong possibility that he would be the one to pull it off that um, I remember debating this. Sometimes we'll put in like a seed investment and just see how something goes. We do this at Giga Fund as well. We'll put in a small amount of money, like it's in the hundreds of thousands. And we're not really that confident the company is going to be one of the most significant companies in the world. We can't know. But in this case, uh, we invested a, a million pounds um, and I also joined the board as a seed investor, which was found so was unusual. And it was, I believe, not recommended by my other partners to go commit this much to the company. But I thought it was important enough. There was, was a chance it could be very, very important. And so I was willing to do the transnet flights and, and, uh, and focus on it uh, from, from, the, from early on. And that, that gave me the influence to do things like bring on on the board later. So I, I'm glad I did that. Yeah, uh, I think uh, we're all quite glad, um, uh, you know, given that DeepMind is, you know, one of the main, um, uh, I guess, um, one of the main, uh, I think, hopes for developing a really strong and beneficial uh, AI. Um, would you kind of like care to say a few words about how you got interested in the kind of like AI safety or um, how AI relates yeah. to long term space in the first place? Rather yeah, well, just Kim, <laughs> you know, my, my view from when I was a, a child was, um, uh, the naive, hopeful uh, vision that it would just be uh, helpful to us. You know, we thought it'd be something, if there was a safety issue, it would be simple. It would be like, like Asimov's Laws of Robotic. They're just three rules and, you know, don't hurt people. <laughs> Otherwise, obey them. And, uh, and so then I kind of forgot about it. And then I got involved in um, the, the kind of, 
the extropian and the singularity movement and the, these these groups they just believed there was un you know I think that's where Mark and I met in those early days and the, the technological progress would just enable everything to be great and we'd, we'd have crypto everything and AI everything and uh, humans would be free and prosperous and happy um, but it's um uh, I started to read Eliezer Yudkowsky's uh, writings that, that there could be uh, risks to technologies and and you know, I, to, 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 to be fair to the experience uh, first of all I, I completely endorse your description and I would say I'm still in that camp but it's not that we didn't worry about the dangers or explore dangers uh, and talk about dangers we did uh, but overall we were technological optimists and I still am yeah yeah so um uh, it, I, I was also overall technological optimist. I don't know what I am now. Well, maybe we'll get to that later. Um, uh, but uh, then it wasn't actually until, uh, it wasn't even quite getting involved in, in, in Mary uh, that got me um, really focused on. I think it was when I began to see that there were AI companies and, and, and a lot of kind of reason, like DeepMind, very reasonable, and it, but there's a few of them. So it wasn't just, well, maybe this one guy will make it work, but actually, oh my God, someone's going to make this work. And, and like soon, like in the time, I, I have an intuition for seeing things in the time scale of, of, of venture capital, which is 10 years. And so it seemed, and I, I'm assuming if my intuition was right, that's telling me we're gonna, we could have an AI in 10 years. That's not, that was wrong. Thank goodness. Um, but that's what my intuition started telling me. And then I got very, very serious. All right. Okay. <laughs> um, I think um, you know you you are you were interested. I, th I guess in, in AI is like one of the one of the uh, the things that you know could could dip us over. And I think uh, actually Jan also mentioned Eliezer's uh, Eliezer's writings as a kind of like tipping point that kind of made him tip into the risk uh, risk aspect of 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 this as well. But you know before wanting to kind of like sidetrack um, kind of like the whole discussion uh, about COVID just yet, but. Um, what, what, how has your thinking on risks um, updated since then? Has anything changed since uh, COVID-19? Has your thinking on AI risk changed since that specifically? Um, it has. Uh, I, I think it's, um, you know, it's not directly related, but what it shows us is it shows us uh, it's like a stress test for all our societies, particularly all our governments. You see how they do with a, you know, society-wide threat. Really mild one. I would call this like the common cold of like existential threats. Okay, <laughs> and we're not doing so well. <laughs> like I would view my the, our society, and I'd be quite, this is, um, uh. I hope not so negative, but like, you know, my father's like in a, in a really, really bad health and he had, he had a flu recently and uh, he, didn't, he didn't do so. He was hospitalized, had respirators and all of this stuff. Uh, actually, he was like one, one step shy of the rest of the need to put the, the ventilator on. Um, so uh, he didn't do so well with the flu. I had the same flu. I was like, you know, I'm sick. I'm throwing up. Like, this sucks. Five days later, I'm fine. Um, our society versus, say, like other societies like Singapore and China and how they've dealt with this, this is really concerning. And we'll see. I, I, I'm hopeful on this that we'll do not too bad. Um, but that's, that's what causes me some concern. When, when, if they're, how do we, first of all, with planning and then responding to it, it's just all not that impressive. Um, so that's, um, that's one part of it, is just making me a little more worried about what the, the state of things are. Uh, and Do you think the private sector, um, like, did it make you um, change your views um, on how the private sector, um, can, what kind of role that could be playing uh, in, in cases where, uh, you know, we suddenly realize the world is, um, is kind of like vulnerable to a few risks in, in certain ways, and we it's cannot- a little, It's a little, yes, it is a little- right uh, it's a little disappointing on the private sector. I would have, this wasn't my area of focus, but I had assumed that there were other people who had this as their uh, area of focus and who had been building up companies, which you know, founder run companies run over decades with a, a mission uh, to, to cure infectious disease or to prevent pandemics. I actually didn't know a lot about it and I'm, I'm learning a little bit more about it now. 
but not you know not that much um, has uh, has happened. So a lot of people who are dedicated to academic researchers, some people in government that are very dedicated, people in nonprofits that are, but um, I didn't see as much private sector uh, preparation for it. Um, I was just thinking today, you know, one, one of the companies I've respected the most is, is Amazon. Um, and, you know, they're just hiring 100,000 workers now. Really? Now? You mean they didn't realize, have somebody looking at, at the r naught and the spread from China before then and then realize, well, they're going to be sitting at home buying things just like they are in China. Probably going to buy it from us. Maybe we should have some people to deliver stuff. I haven't had Amazon delivery in like two freaking weeks. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I'm disappointed in the private sector. Yeah. And I think, you know, this is something that, that was also echoed by, by a few others and actually also something that came up in Jan's session uh, because he's been uh, trying to compile like a, a document on uh, how we can use this um, kind of like this uh, risk um, or uh, this, this risk as an opportunity to actually be doing much better and to be growing like, you know, a stronger immune system going forward. You know, so I'm, I'm, I think that there really is the, uh, right now this vacuum uh, to step into um, uh, into better agency in the future, right? I'm, I'm, I hope so. I'm, gonna write, I'm gonna write a post about that very soon as well. So, yes. Yes. Okay. Um, well, that, yeah, from, I'm, I'm hope I'm hopeful for that still on COVID. Yes. All right. Great. Um, yeah, well, I, th I think I think South Korea in particular. I think that one uh, is going to be. I think for the next decade, we will all be uh, looking at what happened in South Korea and why did it go so well. Yeah. Um, uh, what did South Korea do right that we can learn from? But I think one thing in particular is uh, this thing about uh, learning from uh, other forms of the same kind of danger is they went through SARS in a big way. Uh, this is our SARS experience. That's right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, and we may only get this one shot. Okay. Yeah, so, and, and actually, actually, let's get, and um, this is, is it going to be something that teaches us if this is our SARS, I've heard this from many people who I know who are um, uh, in, in front from the East Asian countries. Uh, are we going to have that same type of lesson or, you know, hormiosis type response to this or actually, or like some older individuals like my father, will we come out worse? And this is what I'm looking for. Are yeah. we going to come out worse? And, and for AI, this is what's going to tell me, Oh man, we're really, really screwed. If we come out worse from this, and and you know, maybe like we just there's a lot of different ways to come out worse. It's not a COVID discussion, so you know, we, yeah, we, yeah. we can match. No, for yeah, sure. We came, okay, we came, so, out, we came out worse from 9/11. So yeah. we came out worse yeah. from 9/11. Let's see. But so, you know, I think as I said in the so. in the beginning, I do think that Milton Friedman quote of you know that only a crisis actually perceived produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. I think you know is is a really powerful reminder of like this is a call to action and not a call uh, I think to get quite so passive. So uh, with that, yes. using that as a segue, perhaps uh, you know to talk a little bit about what you at Gigafund um, are doing. So you know at, at Gigafund, I think it's really really prominent on on your website is that you really have this kind of long term commitment and this kind of like commitment to this more paradigm shifting long term success, and you really make a like big point of that you only invest in founders that you really believe and will be running their company for decades right and you actually really insist on meeting them per, in person and apparently also sometimes joining their boards um and so you know i think um if you could kind of like give us a few tips of like um if you were an investor considering uh, what, what kind of company uh, do you should do you invest in what are you looking for in uh, in, in the founder that uh, will make you think that a um, they are capable of running a company uh, that would be successful. And B, what are you ethically looking for in them? Yeah, actually, this um, this example of this uh, situation, health-wise and economic, that's happening is a great thing because one thing we look for is some uh, founders who who plan for the worst, um, and that. Uh... Hold on. Not an office. Um, so, so, so one thing that we look for at, at, uh, at Gigafund is founders who will persevere for decades. What does that take to persevere for decades? Well, you can't die. Um, so you, you need to have people who will plan for the, the worst things that could happen in a very long period of time. 
uh, not just you know what's going on in, in kind of a venture or capital upswing, which which is Silicon Valley is many many of. So when we dig in with founders, we'll often find that the scenario planning that they have, and um, and they, they don't just think of it as theoretical exercise. They're really ready to execute on on, on extremely uh, difficult situations, companies being out of money or um, uh, you know, product failures, technical failures, they, they have ways of surviving through all of them. And then as we get to know them over time, um, we can see what their responses are. You could see like how, you know, for instance, uh, SpaceX made it through 2008. It really increased my confidence in Elon Musk tremendously. It's such a difficult economic uh, period. And yet um, uh, they were able to, um, you know, not just get the rocket working, but also get a huge contract from NASA and, and keep the company funded um, during an incredibly, incredibly difficult time. Uh, so we look at the kinds of companies, how they respond to this. Some of our companies are becoming stronger in this. They're, they're learning remote work. They're becoming more efficient. Um, you know, they're uh, getting more agile in their, their financing plans. Like all, some of them are getting, and this is what we're looking for actually. So um, it's, it's if you're aware of this as an investor, it's a, it's a great time to invest because otherwise you'd have to invest in them to kind of wait for it to happen as they did with SpaceX when they invested um, in the um, summer of 2008. And then as I saw the different difficult, I told you that I increased my confidence, like doubled and tripled down the company. All right. And I think, you know, that's uh, like a hell of a lot of a good uh, point, I think, to figure out what, what makes companies successful. And do you think, do you, do you have any, let's say like ethical heuristics or something that you apply to um to seek out funders that you think are going to be um going to be uh, going to be doing work that is long-term successful and what do you think about if those two are ever in conflict with each other right because they may be you know every company um that we're building uh every company that we're, we're um uh, working on with the founders is is really at like it's like a personal extension of them and so we want to get to know them and why they're doing it. That's a question we learned to ask at Founders Fund when we really began to invest in this way, very similar way to Giga Fund. Um, we asked them why they're doing it, and we want to get a very, very deep understanding of why they're doing it. All right. And uh, do you have like a few poster childs? I think you named Elon Musk as someone who you believe in uh, that can like really um, kind of like sail the ship during a crisis. Do you have someone of like a founder that? Um, people can be, could be looking up to as a role model for like a really strong, ethical, good commitment to a positive long-term future? Like if you'd had to point, pinpoint to a role model? Or have you seen sometimes, you know, even the opposite, have you sometimes seen like, you know, the, let's say what you thought was a safer way of creating AI or a better way of creating AI being conflict with business interests? And if so, uh, was that handled well or poorly? <laughs> Yeah, I, I would say, um, you know, I, we've only made two significant AI investments. One, one of them is DeepMind, the other one is Luminous Computing uh, here at Gigafund. And in both cases, um, th their approach to, to managing safety and ethics was different, but in both cases, it was, it was very, very thoughtful. Um, and and they, they were quite, quite intent on it. Um, could you say a few, few more words about Luminous? I think people here are familiar with, uh, with DeepMind, but perhaps not so with Luminous. Uh, well, I, I could just say what, what uh, they have said publicly is they're building an yeah. uh, AI chip that will be a thousand times uh, more power efficient than anything that's shipping from Google or any, anybody else. Oh man, uh, okay. Shipping. The, 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 but the, um, the TPU team left and found a Grok and they're excited. Well, okay. It's okay. twice as good, um, but that's just still, we're still going to be so, so, I want to make sure I understood that. Uh, some of the people from the Google TPU team are now at Loomis? Some, in, in, uh, no, they're not that good. Um, uh, we, we have hired a lot of people from uh, top electronic uh, chip design companies and uh, top photonics companies as well uh, at Loomis. I, I just got an update today on some recruiting that they did. It was, I'm very, very, very impressed with their progress. Okay. When? Okay. We can get excited then. Um, thank you. And 
I think that, you know, kind of uh, taking it back to um, when I, uh, 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 I pondered your you know, effective altruism bio for a while. And I think one thing that really kind of perked out at me there is that, you know, you state that uh, you are interested in a realistic and critical examination of political systems and ideology as well. And I think, you know, that is a pretty comprehensive, I think, approach um, kind of to also have as an investor. So I think uh, it's quite interesting because it's a more like ecosystem approach. So um, what do you think, um, you know, in theory, um, you know, for AI to go well, what role, um, you know, do you see nonprofits, for-profits and academia playing in like an ecosystem that goes well? What problems are like each of those kind of packages facing and uh, could they learn from each other? Yeah. I, I think, so I think that the role of the for-profit ecosystem is going to be the, the primary driver of, of action. I think that the non-profit ecosystem um, is useful where there's certain kinds of public goods like just thinking about it or, or certain kinds of fundamental research. Um, and um, the government's important to stop us. <laughs> Um, so, uh, generally I lean pretty libertarian on it. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, that's the, the way that I would, uh, weight, um, the, the, those three areas and how much I would put into them kind of depends on the competence of each of those areas in that society. For instance, if you've got a really incompetent government, well, then you probably have it have it done by the private sector mostly. It's too bad, even though the private sector, it's, it's not good at like stopping itself. It like has a, a race uh, you know, condition problem. But maybe a combination of the private sector and the nonprofit sector or, or, or something like that. It just seems to be what's happening here in, in, in the US at least. Um, but the, the ideal thing would be one where all, all of those different types of institutions would be very, very strong and they could play their role. Okay. Yeah, uh, I think, uh, you know, that, uh, that, that, you know, that is, I think, uh, um, the perfect way, I think, how, how it would run in theory. Uh, that being said, um, you know, do you see that there is actually, um, like, a role to play even for companies, for example, by, um, or by, by investors and to enable, for example, companies, um, like, alternative options to, let's say, military contracts or something with the government um, by investing in them? Or do you, do you somehow see... Um, kind of like as an investor and uh, that there is kind of like a role to play in kind of like playing off the different sectors uh, against each other in a way that uh, is kind of like geopolitically um, more safety enhancing. Now, now how, do you, how do you mean that question? Do you mean that, uh, that, that a company could choose where like where the products end up and stuff like that or? What, well more in the sense that you know like um, if, if many companies are relying um, you know on military contracts uh, I think yeah. you know, for uh, for for really a, lo a lot of their revenue, and I think as an investor, you know, you could almost create an alternative there. Uh, um, if if you were if you're quite altruistic and say, hey, listen up, um, you know, uh, we are going to we're going to give you funding um, regardless of uh, of what of what kind of strings uh, strings you would would have been tied into with the government. I do like, and this I is have a, my I have a contrarian <laughs> view on this. Uh, um, I am not as concerned. Um, about the military contracts um, as long as they are given to uh, very pro AI safety companies. Yeah. Um, that, that will ensure the technology is used in the right way. So what, what I've seen happen um, is uh, at some point the contracts will go to companies that are, you know, just purely profit motivated or maybe even worse, I don't know, you know, if there, there is such a thing. Um, but, uh, and, I, and, I have, and I have seen companies like SpaceX and, and Palantir, I've seen them successfully navigate that um, contracting uh, system and then deliver something that is a net positive. And I would say in the SpaceX case, it's a lot simpler. It's a simpler, it's just, we're going to, do it at a lower price, and we're going to kill fewer astronauts. Why do, you see why do you see Palantir as a net positive? I look at Pal Palantir with horror and terror. I view it as a net positive because uh, we, uh, 
do have the ability for broad surveillance right now. Okay. And if it's, if we don't have the ability for targeted surveillance, there are going to be two things that will happen. Um, we want, we won't actually catch the bad guys. And if you look at the failure of 9-11, we'll have another 9-11. I can't even imagine what's going to happen the next time. Uh, by the way, I actually believe the reason there hasn't been a 9-11 is because of Palantir. They've caught enough of the people early on that we are okay today. Not all of them. We've had some terrorist incidents, but they, they caught a lot of them. Yeah. So that is, that is, that is really, really good for, for our geopolitical stability and the lives of these foreign citizens who are innocent that we would have murdered otherwise. Um, secondly, for civil liberties, you know, the broad net, you know, imagine you have someone uh, just naively, they have like no software tools whatsoever, which actually is the case in like, well, wow, software is so bad. Well, they have to just read through like every random thing and follow every random lead uh, and be, be looking through a lot of personal info of innocent people. The more narrow you can um, make the search and the faster you can you know, get the analysts the result that they need, the less um, private information is going to be trampled on. So it's a harm minimization approach. It's, I prefer to live in a world where there isn't the, you know, the Snowden stuff, but that's what we have. Yeah. So I, harm minimization and, and maxim, maximizing civil liberties. Yeah, I think one thing that Mark and I have been toying around with is how can you do decentralized surveillance systems that uh, are based on encryption where uh, all monitors are also monitor, are being monitored by other monitors. Uh, but I think, yes. um, you know, we're, we're not quite there yet. Um, there's, a, there's a cool aspect in the, in the Palantir software that's like this, which isn't, I, I don't think has the, the, uh, the, the uh, proper cryptography um, in it that, that Mark would be very impressed with it, but uh, it, it has logging built into all of the uh, inquiries so you can validate if people spied on you appropriately. <laughs> like, instead of they did it and no, you know, no, nobody knew because they just deleted the Excel files afterwards. Or, you know, or, or so so uh, unforgeable crypto cumulative cryptographic hashing and all those kinds of safeguards? I, I hope so. I'm not close enough to it to get myself in trouble. Wow. Okay. Okay. So, so, so one of the things that, I mean, just one of the things that you can build even retroactively having accumulated those logs is you could retroactively build uh, zero knowledge systems that could prove, uh, for example, if the, if the government wanted to prove we did not spy on person X because they're being accused yeah. of spying on person X illegally, you could build zero knowledge proof systems that proved that not that they didn't spy on them, but that the log that resulted in this cryptographic hash, which they had already committed to, mm -hmm. that that log does not contain a record of them spying on person X. You could prove that without, without revealing anything else about the log. That's the, what the zero it's knowledge is. It's really, really cool. And it would only work if Palantir beat out every single other defense contractor um, and became the only source of uh, the, only, you know, the, the only source of information awareness for our government, which I'm sure they would love to do, but they're not going to get there. But actually, it brings me up to a point of, of AI uh, safety where a lot of people uh, favor the singleton approach or the monopoly approach. Like, we're going to get there first and, you know, and we'll, we'll be the, we'll control the whole thing by being there first. And, um, this is, uh, you know, this has, uh, yeah, um, doing this. In the absence of a competent regulatory approach, I, I think this might be where we just actually end up because people will end up competing. Um, and I, I think uh, there's an argument that's, e that's even better. Um, um, but uh, I would prefer an approach where there could be multiple uh, takes at this. Um, yeah. So th it's, just, it's just an interesting thing that happens with, uh, with a company that does have a, a very positive mission and everyone else is doing a terrible job. And 
then I think the right thing for them is to go ahead and just try to win. Yeah, I think uh, like we, we talk about that somewhat in the book draft that we're currently writing, but I think, um, you know, we, we're trying to talk, we're talking a lot about compensating dynamics. So how can we, how can smaller actors actually create compensating dynamics by which they kind of counteract uh, the comparative advantage that larger uh, actors uh, uh, accrue as they're growing and, uh, and, and as they're having economies of scale. And, you know, I think that uh, you could also even make an argument that companies uh, could do that by um, uh, even kind of like by providing some, counter uh, some counterweights against large governments. So if you have a lot of cross, uh, cross jurisdictional collaboration across companies and uh, within the private sector, that this actually creates a, a better, like let's say anti-fragile system because the power of individual governments will be somewhat constrained uh, because you have this um, kind of like private sector uh, safety net almost build up. Um, what, do you have any thoughts on this? Do you mean um, having companies uh, essentially cooperate in, uh, in buildings. For instance, in some, some way that open source cooperates to build, um, you know, build up value. Yes, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. O open source is the clearest example. Um, uh, one thing that, you know, I've seen is that uh, if you have a project that's purely within a company, then the company uh, you know, th then you're always in fear that the company will suddenly make a management decision to shut down the, the project uh, or to completely uh, change its goals. Uh, so one thing I've seen, I'm sure you have as well, is sometimes projects are collaborations between companies or consortia projects or whatever. Um, uh, and then each of the participants from each of the companies has much more confidence that their company won't shut down their side of the project because then it's a visible shutting down of the collaboration with the other companies. Yeah. Yes, I think that's it's quite, yeah, quite interesting, yeah. And, um, all right, so I think, you know, I, I think another thing that you mentioned um, is also that, um, I think this was in an interview uh, that was on your EA bio, but I stalked you all over the place. So uh, uh, another thing that you're mentioning is that, um, you know, you are kind of like, a little um, uh, unsettled, I guess, that uh, the Silicon Valley uh, ecosystem has become uh, a quite expensive really for startups and, and then also um, kind of like is increasingly showing institutionalized thinking. So I was wondering, you know, um, what do you mean by, by institutionalized thinking and, um, and what, what kind of um, effect do you think does it have on, on creating um, safe uh, and beneficial AI? Yes. So here, here, here's, here's what I mean. Um, uh, when you see companies believe that they have to make a certain business because it's the popular business with the VCs or it's the acceptable uh, way. Um, and I have heard one of these just recently, a few weeks ago, like during, you know, I was like, wow, you cannot be doing this during the COVID crash. Like you need to be focused on reality. <laughs> <laughs> not on the because the VCs they're all going to go away <laughs> so it's, it's quite interesting right people are so stuck they're, they're so in in Silicon Valley as an institution that you not realize it's, it's now gone they still continue to act as if they need to please these uh, people um like you're no you don't need to do, no you need to just preserve cash and build a you know a sensible business uh and uh, so that's one of, one of them is that, you know, building businesses to please VCs who are making investments to please their institutional investors, that doesn't like lead to um, smart outcomes. Um, and uh, there can be other, um, yeah, there can be, it, it, it's harder and harder um, as, as you get this high, high social density in Silicon Valley. Um, it's harder and harder to break out from the pack. You, you're very clearly identified and very, very quickly punished on Twitter or, or somewhere else um, for, for being outside the pack. When the, uh, the density was low, uh, you, it, this was less likely to happen to you. It was more friendliness to very weird um, companies pursuing um, extremely different approaches. Yeah, uh, I, I I kind of agree. Um, only having been there for five years now, it's uh, it's kind of starting to to sink in a little. Okay, um, I want to uh, give some time for all the participants uh, here that have been so patiently waiting. Um, I think if you want to 
raise um, your hand um, via the raise hand button or just hold it up in your video and then I'll monitor and try to try to catch your question if you have any. I also have a few more in petto <laughs> uh, if you prefer me to go along with that. Can I add one more thing on this Silicon Valley institutionalization? Yeah. Thing? Yeah. The, the other thing that's screwed up is the, the pricing, um, the uh, real estate. Um, so people that are, that are innovative often work in the garage or like maybe just off of their, your own savings. And that's um, a lot hard to do. And, and they think it's fine because huge venture capital funds have been raised to pay your rent. But you're not as free with this money as, as you are with your own money. And, and I think it's a big loss. So all of these things, COVID might be a great thing for Silicon Valley. I, I, I've left, you know, it's, it's I think, you know, I, I, I hope it, uh, it, can, it can improve itself, but. Um, yeah. uh, along those lines, by the way, I want to applaud Zoom. At this point, they've probably already saved millions of lives. Yep, applause, applause. Um, I think we can even do that uh, via a reaction here. I'm giving Zoom an applause right now. Yes. Um, um, okay. Um, uh, okay, well, uh, am I missing a question here? Um, if not, then I'll go ahead and just please interrupt me or just, uh, oh, wait, I saw I, a hand. I have I Samu, 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 Samu. Yeah. Please go ahead. Okay, VCs are very busy on Twitter. That's arguably because most of them are not that busy elsewhere. So why has it been that aside from um, basically conveying the information to say a broader audience the way Balaji has, there's been actually very little, you know, very little forward motion in terms of Silicon Valley just unilaterally organizing to do anything. Like you probably hear stuff from your colleagues talking about, oh, maybe we should do something, maybe we should do something else. And it's like, the world has really shifted. A lot of those funds will just not exist in a year or two years. So why do they seem to be able to process the information, receive it from the weird corners of Twitter, mm -hmm. but not translate it into action into new, weirder, useful projects, like the time-sensitive ones, like, say, Matt Palmer, who just, you know, went out there and is now manufacturing the N95 masks, whether or not he gets permission to do it. It's great. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad people are, have uh, taken that action. Um, it's, and I personally experienced this throughout this because I, I saw this ahead of time and then I noticed how difficult it was to take action early on, even seeing obvious things. Uh, the, um, uh, the social pressure is much more stifling than people realize. And, and this, this also extends to the, the, the little social behaviors we're supposed to be, be doing to, to make, uh, the, to mitigate the, the effects of the, the pandemic. Like we, we, we had a chat earlier that Nicole organized with, with, with some friends uh, to d discuss like Freudian psychology and it, you know, half the chat got taken over by, by, by the COVID things. But one of them that we were, we were looking at is that the uh, people, it was so, why was it so difficult? We had someone from China there and uh, it's like, oh, you just do X, Y, and Z, and you just do them. Why, and why is it so difficult? And some of it's the social pressure you face from putting a mask on when no one else is doing it, or doing something slight, even just slightly different than anybody else, is way more massive than anyone wants to admit. It's way more massive. And you need kind of a new, like, uh, cultural shelling point or something like that. It needs to um, amass a little, uh, um, um, you know, it needs to amass a little before uh, people can start to move. Uh, and uh, it, this, you know, this one didn't, you know, it moved so fast, there wasn't a chance for that to happen. Like it, you can, it can only happen at the kind of maximum rate of cultural um, adaptation. And so unfortunately- to move from, from private to community knowledge was the difficult one then, and the community social expectations. Yes, right, it's, and, and it had to, it, there's a certain speed at which those, those things can kind of happen, and it, it was slower than the virus. Well, I'm going to say I only am asking this difficult question because VCs actually did shockingly well compared to any other mainstream class of American society, including Wall Street, right? Like the market was not pricing any of this stuff in until, uh, you know, until basically everyone knew. So in a very real sense, VCs were, you know, they outperformed New York, let's put it that way. 
That'd be fair. Yeah. Um, but, um, but in terms of collectively acting, I, I, I'm disappointed. All right. Um, okay. I had David see his hand up. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, so Luke, say an AGI startup approaches you yeah. looking for funding. How would you know if it's a net positive to fund them or not? Yeah, this is a good question. Um, if the company is going to work, um, then it is almost always a net positive because you want to keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Now, if you can handle it. So, so you, you would, to me, that sounds like you would found all, uh, any AGI startup that approaches you. I mean, if they oh, show I, to I haven't seen any up. evil AGI startups like okay. that, are, that are successful. Like the, I haven't seen the scary, you know, thing, but, um, you know, I, I suppose that will eventually happen. All right. All right. Um, is there a, another question here? from the audience. I'm monitoring all of you. Um, no, okay, then uh, I'll, I'll go with another one. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, we've been, I, like wh whatever I, like I do those uh, conferences even, like I can't help but think, oh my God, if we were actually taking this seriously, we would be doing different things. Um, you know, I, I still feel like so often you go to a conference or to a meeting and I'm hosting conferences and meetings where, you know, people are presenting something and it's like, nice, you talk about it and, 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 and it's good, but you know, it, it still kind of feels like we're circling the thing. Um, and you know, there are those certain kind of like, I guess, like, um, packages like conferences or like companies or kind of like prepackaged things that we use to, um, kind of like do a certain function but sometimes you know i wonder if that function couldn't be achieved much better if we were actually as serious about the thing as we always say we are um, um and so i'm wondering you know if you could do like a tabula rasa and had like no kind of like denominators such as conferences and companies and you know the way that your social expectation hold you to engage in those things like you know do a research review or something um is you know could you come up with like better more effective ways um of just you know, kind of like coordinating, um, coordinating ourselves to come up with kind of like futures that get at this kind of like really uh, insane future that we can all hold in our hands, um, but that, you know, we seem to be kind of like um, strapped into a, a little bit further away from. <laughs> well, it's um, one thing that I've been If really what inhibits people a lot of the time is the social pressure of the community they are in, what if we could get a better understanding of how that works and what that is to give people some more flexibility in action? And I would just give you an example of the founders fund culture, for instance, which is the, you know, the, the best invested culture other than, of course, the giga fund that I've ever worked in. Uh, it, there, there's a, it allowed a really uh, unique type of independent thinker to, to thrive, uh, it, which could not thrive in a normal venture capital firm, where you, there's a lot of fitting in and pleasing other people and showing that you have a hot deal and like a lot of uh, different problems. Um, so you could kind of structure the, uh, the group interactions in a way that in this case it would have um, just the outcome of like really, really good thinking and then occasionally some good action on investments that came out of that thinking. It was kind of a low bar. You know, you didn't need sustained execution over decades <laughs> on, on that thinking. Uh, you just need to kind of get it right, um, you know, episodically. Uh, so for some of these other projects, you know, that, that's, that's what I've you know, been able to solve for in my life so far. I don't know how to ex extend that, but I think there's something to that um, where um, perhaps we need to build a different type of community in which we're um, maybe measuring each other or fitting in in, in slightly different ways. Um, 
and, and that would enable us to take action on the, uh, the much, much longer term uh, impact things. All right, yeah, thanks. I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think I read in zero to one that one thing that uh, Peter liked about you was your um, uh, at least initial interest in cryo, uh, like uh, in cryonics, um, uh, despite, uh, and, and that was still at a time when uh, I think when it, when it was, I think much more early uh, for, for others to tip in and, and he, he, he took that as a kind of like indicator that, uh, that, that you're not prone to, uh, to, to group her thinking that much. Is that correct? I think I'm correct memory. In yes, this. and this is, this, is, this is really interesting. It's one of the great things about Peter. It's he was not just creating an environment for those people. He was looking for those people that were you know, willing to do something that was obviously, um, you know, even if it was a bad idea, um, I think he ended up signing up eventually. I think I ended up, well, I'm unsigned up now. Am I unsigned up? I think I'm unsigned up. I, I signed up in 1987. Okay, Mark. I can get into my theory about what, why, why cryonics uh, doesn't work, but um, uh, yes, uh, that we need to create an environment for more of those pe people to, to feel okay and to, um, uh, and to share their ideas um, and to be able to act over yeah. the long term. That's yeah. very hard. It's, it's really hard, yeah. We I, were I able to I... do the first two parts. Yeah. Yeah. Of the pseudonym is actually a big threat here because it was the pseudonymous Twitter accounts that made the you know very strong and organization critical arguments. Like right now, I think people feel free to be online who they are, but it's really like the last gasp. I think you know I've seen many people who's um, who show real and justified fear even expressing themselves under pseudonyms, right? Yeah, this is a concern. Um, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, how, do you have any ideas on how to solve this? This is. Uh, we actually discussed this in a previous session uh, where Mark uh, was was uh, having some suggestion. Could you give a keyword on that if people want to look it up? Well, um, the, the main thing is that uh, uh, we've got with modern cryptography, we've got pseudonyms, but strong uh, unforgeability, which is to say. Uh, uh, protections against impersonation. So then repeated electronic interactions, repeated postings, whatever, under a pseudonym uh, causes a buildup of reputation, uh, reputation feedback. Uh, there's, we need to be careful with pseudonyms that there's an unlimited number of pseudonyms. Pseudonyms are free. So the, in crypto, this is known as the Sybil problem. You can't trust something just because it claims to be a new identity. You can't invest trust per identity. The uh, trust has to be earned. But once it is earned, then that valuable reputation itself creates an interest by the, the entity that holds it to continue to earn the positive reputation or he loses the sort of accumulated was, capital of other people's trust. But what Luke, I think, and Samuel were getting at was more that there is a disconnect between, I think, uh, that uh, pseudonym and then real world action or like you know coordinating in person is that correct luke um actually um not um that but that uh even the suit that that as well okay but also <laughs> that the pseudonym isn't perfect uh, oh yeah because yeah. you will leak out information uh through a pseudonym um and um you know, and people not, they're not even gonna try. There's also a social aspect to this. You've got to really notice your uh, psychology. Um, you, if your intention, and it could be a hidden intention, which is by the way, what our other um, video thing was about, is, is these hidden intentions people are not aware of, uh, is to uh, let people know something about you and you need that to be personal, you'll leak it out regardless of the technology. Yeah. So I think yeah. it's a so, human problem too. Yeah, Satoshi uh, is an extraordinary example. Absolutely extraordinary example. <laughs> yes, that's, that's correct. Okay, Chris, you had your hand up for a long time, uh, so. If yeah, you... no problem. Um, I just wanted to, to talk, to return briefly to some of the security relevant topics that were, that were brought up. Um, I'm, you know, working on the working at the Pentagon now, and uh, this sort of 
how do you, how do you from the government side, right? How do you get um, companies from Silicon Valley and innovators to sort of consider working with the government, and how do you like mitigate some of the ethical concerns that uh, companies may have? So I was wondering, um, Luke, if you would talk a little bit about uh, you you mentioned you know some of the feeling like Palantir was a success case in SpaceX. I wondered if you if you talk a little bit more structurally about like um, how do you think that conversation is going? I guess in the valley, and uh, what do you think needs to what would be desirable in terms of like creating like a, a, a government uh, or, or military really uh, and Silicon Valley sort of relationship that is like pro-social in the long term, especially um, with regards like more advanced AI capabilities. Hmm. Okay. I think uh, if more entrepreneurs took the responsibility on themselves and didn't just, you know, think like, oh, because like my favorite people in the administration now, now I will do that. Or um, because I'm going to, you know, I want some program to be there to help me to make it easy. Um, but really uh, took the long view of like, I, you know, my business is actually a very, very, um, important part of all gigafund companies eventually if you if you are going to be dominating or re completely reshaping the entire industry you will be interacting with the government so we almost always get into that conversation with people uh, it, it might not be for for you know 10 plus years that they're, that they're involved in I mean, maybe it's 15 years it's the scope of an ordinary venture fund investing um, but uh, you need to proactively and independently craft your strategy for uh working with with the government and it will be specific to each of these companies. Um, and it shouldn't just be the acceptance of institutions as they are. Um, it's, you should take some responsibility in educating the institutions um, and bending the institutions to, uh, to your need. Sure, so it sounds like you're focusing kind of on the, at the founder level there. Do you think there are things that funders or like the broader social uh, organism or whatever, uh, can do to like create founders that have that mindset or to like promote that kind of attitude? Or do you think it's just sort of, we just got to go by individuals and just try to promote people who've got the right, you know, uh, attitude? Well, certainly broadly, socially, I, we shouldn't be punishing people for working with the government. It seems like the libertarians punish mm -hmm. people for working with the government. I remember a friend, a friend of mine who I was trying to, you know, get him into SpaceX at like, you know, um, uh, it's like a while ago, it's like right in the first, right, almost the, the first or second round I invested in. He's like, oh, but this is not, this is someone who's like surviving off of government contracts. They're evil. Um, and then there's the, the then people who like don't like it if the wrong party's in the government. Now they hate the government because the wrong party's not, they won't work with them. It, we've got to um, um, not, uh, uh, and, and not, and then they like, punish those companies if they're work, you know, working with, you know, with, with, the, with the, the government if they're in the wrong party. We've just got to make it okay uh, to work with the government. Like provided you're doing something that is helping America. <laughs> like, which, uh, uh, you know, it's a lot of the uh, companies that are in the entrenched industries where they've you know, been doing it for decades, um, those companies are not doing that anymore. It may have been the intention of the founders, it's not. Um, Silicon Valley should have more confidence in itself and in its founders that the new companies are building will be trying to do something positive for the country. Yeah, all right, thanks. And I, I think a few even come to mind, but uh, Roxanne, we have uh, three minutes left. Do you maybe uh, wanna ask Luke a last question? Um, this has been really great so far. I'm loving it. I want, I want to comment on that last one. Uh, wait, uh, could we have Roxanne ask a question because she hasn't spoken at all yet? Sure. Yes, I'm sorry. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Um, appreciate you uh, having this discussion. Um, so I, I was interested in getting uh, a clearer sense of, of your thoughts on the AI safety landscape now. Um, I know that you're looking for founders who are quite attentive to safety concerns. 
Um, but it also seems like a lot of people, as we heard in the, the talk with Jan earlier, are also shifting their views uh, towards uh, maybe a slower uh, type of takeoff scenario or um, you know, less of a, a prosaic AI than uh, the sort of Fugikowskian view. I'm, I'm interested if this is playing at all into your thinking on investment decisions or the kinds of technologies that you think uh, we need right now. Um, so I've always thought that it's, um, I'm more interested in the interactions of the early AIs. I, I think it was going to take longer than most people thought, and it would be the interactions of early AIs and society that would kind of get us uh, to where we are. So, um, and that's, that's why I was, I think the geopolitical landscape and the founder um, aspect of it, those are all very, very important things. Um, and perhaps if you have this very steep, fast takeoff, you just, all you have to do is get the math right and you, you, you build one and then you let, you let it loose. Um, I think it's going to be more iterative. So all of these different uh, pieces end up being levers. All right. Thank you so much. Roxanne, do you want to chime in again? Yeah, I was, I was hoping to tack on another question, but if it goes too long, I right. understand. Tag it on, and once we're, uh, once we're three, we're just going to stop, but tag it on. Cool. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if you think then, uh, if it's more going to be a, a, a series of, and not sure this, this is implied by what you were saying, but like a cascade of effects in the way that we've seen COVID has a cascade of effects on, yes, right. uh, you know, social stability. Are there, are there really different kinds of startups that you'd want to be investing in in that case? Um, that's a great question and I won't have enough time to answer it, but yes. Um, I, I think you should, you should contact him about that. Um, and uh, I thank you all uh, so much for joining the session. Um, I think I really, really cherish the point that uh, you made about like, Let's create like a community in which we can hold each other accountable, in which we don't ha have to signal too much, but in which we can actually have real discussion. I think that's what we are kind of creating today. Um, uh, and I really um, thank you all for joining us uh, in this experiment. And I'll meet you in a second again in the main Zoom room for report outs. Luke, do you know where to find it? Because you're going to do a three minute report out on your session, unless you want me to do it. Yes, it works. Yep. Yes, it works. Okay, then we'll meet you in the main room just now. Yeah, See you in a sec. Bye-bye.